Chapter Fifteen of The Sea Witch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elliot Miller. The Sea Witch by Matcher and Murray Ballou. Chapter Fifteen: The Escape. Charles Bramble found himself playing a dangerous part. It was true that Leonard Hust had freed his hands from those shackles that had confined them so long, and had pointed out to him the way to retreat and escape. But he must run the gauntlet of dangers in order to do so. As to fear, it was a sensation he knew not. But prudence was much more requisite in this instance than any especial degree of courage, as is always the case on board a man of war, especially when lying in port, where the escape to the shore is easy. Sentinels were placed at stem, stern, and waist of the English ship, at all hours, pacing their allotted round of the deck, and keeping watchful guard over every avenue of exit from the vessel. The only possible plan of escape that suggested itself to Charles Bramble, under the circumstances, was to place a few necessary articles of clothing in a small package, and confine it to the back of his neck. While he should divest himself of all garments, slip quietly into the water on the seaward side of the ship, where none of the sentries were immediately placed, the object being to guard the access to the shore more especially. Once in the water, he had only to strike out quietly for the shore, trusting the dullness of the sentries and the favoring darkness of the night to enable him to reach the land unobserved. He had the most to fear from the sentry placed on the top-gallant forecastle of the ship as that post was so near to his line of passage. He would have to swim around the bows far enough to clear the land tackle, and when he got on an even line with the ship's bows, the sentry, if he happened to be on the lookout at the moment, could hardly fail to see him on the surface of the water. To obviate this difficulty, Leonard Hust, who was a sort of privileged person on board, being the captain's confidential servant and man of all work, undertook to engage the sentry's attention by sonic device, for a few moments, just at the opportune period, while the prisoner should be fairly clear of the ship. "'See here, Bill,' said Leonard Hust, carelessly, as he emerged from the forehatch. "'Look ye, old boy, I've had such a dream. Hang me if I can sleep a wink.' "'What's that to me?' growled the sentry, morosely, and not much more than half awake. "'Why, if you knew what it was I dreamed—' "'You would think it was something to you,' continued the other, with assumed mystery and seriousness. "'Look ye, Anodust, said the Marine. "'Do you know you are talking to a sentry on duty, and it's clearly against the rules of the ship to do so?' "'Why, as to the matter of that, I don't see hut that you as much to blame as I am,' continued the other. "'But who is there to peach on either of us?' "'That's true,' added the Marine, bringing the butt of his musket lightly to the deck. "'But for all that, Leonard, it's dangerous business, or if you see if— Hello, what's that? Nothing, nothing but me drawing this cork, said the other, quickly producing a small bottle of brandy from his pocket, and urging the marine to drink. The temptation was too great, and the sleepy and tired sentinel drank a heavy draught of the liquor, smacking his lips, and forgetting the sound he had just heard, and which Leonard Hust very well knew was caused by the prisoner's descent a little too quickly into the water alongside the ship. "'Now, Bill, what do you think I did dream?' continued the captain's man. "'Bother it, how can I tell?' answered the marine. "'Let it out if it's worth telling. "'Why, do you see, Bill, I kept tossing and turning uncomfortable-like for an hour or so, until finally I thought I saw you, with your face as black as an ace of spades, and your body dangling by the neck from the main yard arm of the ship. A dead man!' "'Well, that's comfortable at any rate,' said the Marine. "'And you needn't trouble yourself in future, Leonard us, to repeat your dreams to me, especially if they are personal.' "'Never mind, man. It was all a dream, no truth in it, you know. Come, old boy, let's take another drink for companionship, and then good night to you, and I'll turn in.' The Marine greedily drained the rest of the bottle, and with swimming eyes thanked Leonard for his kindness, bade him good night, and with an unsteady step, resumed his musket and his walk upon the forecastle. In the meantime Charles Bramble, who was an expert swimmer, had got out of gunshot and even sight of the ship, 
or rather where his head could not be discovered from the ship's deck, and was nearing the shore very fast. He had secured, as he proposed, sufficient clothing upon the back of his neck, and in an oilcloth covering so as to keep it dry, to equip himself quite comfortably on landing, and in these garments he was soon dressed again, and making his way through the town to the mission house, where he knew Helen Huntington and her mother used to be, and where he knew also that he could find at last temporary lodgings. He had no longer any fear that his brother would resume the charge concerning him before the court, bad as he knew him to be. He did not believe that he would do this, though he doubted not that he would have managed to keep him in confinement, and perhaps to have carried him thus to England, partly from revengeful feelings towards him, and partly to keep him out of the presence of her whom he so tenderly loved. But, lest his brother should be betrayed by his feelings into any extremity of action concerning him, he resolved at once to write him a note, declaring that their relationship was known, and that should any further persecution be offered, the same at once be made public to the oppressor's disgrace. With this purpose, he hardly awaited the breaking of day before he possessed himself of writing materials, and wrote and dispatched the following to his brother. Captain Robert Bramble, about the same time you receive this note, you will also be made aware, doubtless, of my escape from Durance Vile in your ship. The purpose of my sending yon this is not to ask any favours at the hand of one who was never actuated towards me, even in childhood, by a brother's regard, but whose sole desire and purpose have been to oppress and injure one related to him by the nearest ties of relationship. My object is rather to let you know that any further attempt to arraign me before the court will lead at once to a public declaration of the fact that you are my brother, a relationship which necessity alone will compel me to publish to the people of Sierra Leone, Charles Bramble, alias Captain Will Ratlin. Charles Bramble felt that he was safe from further immediate oppression on his brother's part and it was only necessary for him to keep quietly within doors until some chance for shipping from the port should occur, to enable him to distangle himself from the singular web of circumstances which chance had woven so net-like about him. In spite of the sad accomplishments of the realization of his condition as it regarded his brother, and the partial danger of his present position, yet there was a lightness to his heart, a buoyancy in his breast, which he had not known for nearly a score of years, for he now felt that all shame of birth was removed from him, that he was respectably and even highly born, and that in point of blood was even the equal, full equal, of that fair and lovely girl he regarded so devotedly. Of course there was no disguise between Charles Bramble and Helen, and her mother as to the charge brought against him. They knew very well that he had been engaged in the evil trade of the coast, but they knew also that he had conducted his part of the business upon the most humane principles which the traffic would admit, and that he was not such a principal but an agent in the business, sailing his ship as rich owners had directed, and also that besides the fact of his having utterly renounced the trade altogether since he became acquainted with Helen Huntington his heart and feelings had never been engaged in its necessary requirements. Realizing these facts, we say, neither Helen nor her mother regarded Captain Ratlin, the only character in which they yet knew him, to be actually and seriously culpable as to at charge of inhumanity. The gratification which Helen evinced on meeting him the next morning after his escape from the ship was too honest, too unmistakable, in its import not to raise up fresh hopes in his heart, that, in spite of his seeming disgrace, his confinement as a prisoner, his trial as an outlaw, and his fallen fortunes generally, still there was one heart that beat purely and tenderly with at least a sister's affection for him. And even Mrs. Huntington, who had not for one moment suspected the true state of her daughter's sentiments towards the young commander, did not hesitate to salute him tenderly and assure him of her gratification at his release from bondage. She was a generous-hearted woman, frank and honorable in her sentiments, 
and she secretly rejoiced that they had herself, the daughter, untidily, been able to exert a refining influence over so chivalric and noble a character, as she fully realized Captain Ratlin to be at heart, and in all his inward promptings. Charles Bramble still hesitated as to revealing his relationship to Captain Robert Bramble, from real feelings of delicacy, even to Mrs. Huntington, whom he felt he could trust, partly because he had reason to know that the mother had favored the suit of his brother, whom Helen had rejected in India, and partly because, at present, of his own equivocal situation. But to Helen herself he felt that he might, indeed that he must, reveal the important truth, and that very evening, as they sat together in one of the spacious apartments of the mission house, he took her hand within his own, and asked her if he might confide in her as he would have done a dear sister. "'You know, Captain Ratlin, that I feel so much indebted to you, in so many ways, that any little service I am capable of doing for you would be but a grateful pleasure,' was the instant and frank reply of the beautiful girl, while a heightened glow mantled her cheek. "'Then, Helen, listen to me. And if I am too excited in speaking of a subject so immensely important to me, I trust you will forgive me. Already I have given you a rough outline of my story, rough and uncouth indeed, since I could give it no commencement. You will remember that, previous to the fall I got on shipboard, while a boy in the Sea Lion, I could recall no event. It was all a blank to me, and my parentage and my childhood were to me a sealed book. Strange as it may seem, that book has been opened, and the story is now complete. I know all. Indeed, indeed, I am rejoiced to hear you say so, was the earnest reply, while the countenance of the fair creature by his side was lighted up by tenderness and hope. You look pleased, Helen, he continued, but supposing the gap in my story, which is now filled up, had better for my own credit have remained blank. That cannot be. I feel that it cannot be," she said, almost eagerly. Supposing that it is now a certain that the parents of the sailor boy, whose story you have heard, deserted him because of necessity, supposing they were poor, very humble, but not dishonest, would such facts rob me of your continued kind feelings? You know, Captain Radlin, that you need not ask such a question she replied, as she looked into his face with her whole gentle soul upon through her eyes. "'You are too kind, too trusting in your confidence in me, Helen,' he said. The only reply was from her downcast eyes, and still a warmer blush which covered the delicate surface of her temples, and glowed in silent beauty upon her cheek. "'Helen,' continued he by her side, in tones of tenderness that were momentarily becoming more and more gentle more and more expressive of the deepest feeling. Helen, do you remember the days of your childhood, at home, in far-off England, at home near Bramble Park? Yes, yes, she answered eagerly. But why do you speak of those days? She looked into his face as he asked, almost as though she could read his meaning. Do you remember Robert Bramble, then? Well, well— and do you remember his brother, Helen? Gracious heavens, yes, she quickly answered, almost anticipating his words. Well, Helen, Charles Bramble is before you. She did not faint, nor utter a shriek at the effect of the powerfully condensed feelings which crowded upon her heart and senses, but she stood for one moment gazing at him as though a veil had been removed from her eyes recalling in one instant of time the sweet memories of their childish days together, recalling even the kiss, the last kiss he had given her years, years before, when he saw her for the last time, until they met in the broad ocean. She recalled these things and a thousand more in a moment of time. She remembered how strangely the tones of his voice had affected her from the outset, how they had seemed to awaken dreams of the past nearly every time she listened to him, these things she thought like a flash of mind in one instant, and then, covering her face with her hands, sobbed aloud. One moment Charles Bramble stood and looked upon that long-loved, beautiful form, 
one moment, like herself, recalled the past, the sunshine of his childish hours, ay, even the last kiss which she, too, remembered, now that so much had been recalled, and then he tenderly drew the weeping, loving girl to his heart, and whispered to her how dearly he loved her still. End of chapter 15《Sixteen of the Sea Witch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elliot Miller. The Sea Witch by Maturin Murray Ballou. Chapter Sixteen: The Cannibals. The first intimation of his brother's escape from confinement reach Captain Bramble through the letter which we have already given to the reader. His rage knew no bounds. He saw at once that he was foiled completely, that he could do nothing towards his arrest, even without casting such dishonor upon his own name as would publicly disgrace him for all time to come. In vain were all his efforts to discover the guilty assistance or assistant of the prisoner, as it was not known at what hour he escaped. Even the three sentinels on duty at the time could not be identified, though Leonard Huss's friend Bill did more than suspect that some trick had been played upon him during his watch. But he could say nothing about the matter without making too such a case of self-crimination as to ensure punishment, and that, too, of the most sanguinary character. Leonard Huss knew this and feared him not. There was another party sadly disappointed in this state of affairs, one who only assumed sufficient importance to be noticed when her services were needed, but she nevertheless felt and suffered, probably, as much as any one of our characters. We refer to Maud Leonardo. She had found lodgings in an obscure residence in the town during the course of the trial, and had resolved to remain until the sentence was given of the result of which no one doubted, and even until the detail of that sentence should be executed, which he had already learned would doubtless be death by hanging at the yard-arm of the ship in which he was confined. Poor girl! It was sad to think that she could gloat over this anticipated result. Such was the power of her revenge. But in the same ratio to the intensity of her secret satisfaction, at the hoped-for execution of Captain Will Ratlin, whom she had once loved, but now so bitterly hated, was her disappointment, vexation, and uncontrollable anger at the idea of his escape, of which she was one of the first to learn. Captain Robert Bramble, though he did not attempt to find his brother, would hardly have believed that he would remain openly in town, and at the mission house. But Maud reasoned more truly. It was the first thought that had entered her head that he had probably gone thither to be near and with Helen Huntington, and thither she stealthily crept, and watched until she saw him, and thus satisfied herself. Knowing nothing of the discovery that had been made, she hastened to give information to Captain Bramble, supposing that he would take steps for his immediate arrest, but in this she was disappointed. She could not understand the apathy which seemed to have overcome the English officer who so lately had thirsted for the young commander's blood, and she went away from him amazed and dejected. In vain, thus far, had her attempts resulted as to sacrificing him whom she had so bitterly despised. She had trusted to others thus far. This she said to herself, as she mused at the fruitless attempts she had been engaged in, now she would trust to herself but how to do it she hardly knew. When he was under her father's roof, and she unsuspected of hostility to him, it would have been an easy matter, with her knowledge of poisons, to have sacrificed his life. But now it was not so very easy for her to find an opportunity for any sort of approach to him. But this seemed her last and only resource of vengeance, and she cared to live only to con consummate it. Actually afraid to bring his brother again to trial, for fear of a personal exposure, Captain Robert Bramble was now in a quandary. He was looked to by the court for a conclusion of the suit he had brought, and was now so situated that he found it necessary to screen that brother whom he had 
so bitterly disliked, from the cognizance of the authorities. Indeed, he became nervous lest the exposure should become public in spite of his efforts at concealing the singular facts. All this, of course, tended to the safety of his brother Charles, who had rightly anticipated this state of affairs in relation to the part that Robert must needs enact, and therefore felt perfectly safe in awaiting an opportunity for shipment to England in the first vessel bound thither and it was at once agreed between Mrs. Huntington, Helen, and himself that they would go together. The period of the return of Captain Bramble's ship to England was fast approaching, and passage had been offered to Helen and her mother therein. But Helen had promptly declined it, and induced her mother to do so also, though it required some persuasion to bring this result about. Charles Bramble, of course, kept within doors at Sierra Leone, and did not, by exposing his person, provoke arrest. He was reading aloud to Helen, a few days subsequent to his escape from his brother's ship, when the door of the room was stealthily opened, and a person stepped in. "'Well, Leonard Hust,' said Charles Bramble, "'what has brought Jan here so clothed in mystery? Art well, my good fellow?' "'Yes, very well, Master Charles, but I come to tell you that you must get away from this place, for a few days at least. It's not safe for you.' "'What's in the wind, Leonard? Have the courts sent me out?' "'Yes, Master Charles, and your brother Robert has agreed to deliver you up.' "'Has he?' added Charles Bramble, musing. "'I did not expect that.' "'Yes, sir, and I thought I would just slip over here and advise you to get off as quick as possible.' for the officers will be over here in an hour or so. Thank you, Leonard. What is that protruding from your pocket? Pistols, sir. Very good, Leonard. I will borrow them. They're yours, sir, with all my heart. Are they loaded, Leonard? With two slugs each, sir, and as true as a compass. These formidable preparations startled Helen, who looked beseechingly towards him, whom she loved better than her own life. She came and placed a hand timidly upon his shoulder, and looked into his face with all the wealth of her heart expressed in her eyes, and she said, "'Pray, pray, Charles, be cautious. Be prudent for my sake, will you not?' "'I will, dearest,' he whispered, as he leaned forward and pressed his lips to her pure white forehead. "'We shall not long be separated. I feel that we shall not.' Leonard Hust, who had befriended the younger brother whilst the two were under the parental roof, still clung to the interest of Charles Bramble. He had already procured for him a guide, a negro runner, who knew the coast perfectly, and with him for a companion and a small pack of provisions, and well armed, Charles Bramble determined to make his way by land back to Don Leonardo's factory on the southern coast. In so doing, he would be able to not only elude all pursuit, but would also be able to further his own pecuniary interest by settling up his affairs with Don Leonardo, and arranging matters as to the property that had been entrusted to him by the owners of the Sea Witch. Charles Bramble awaited impatiently the coming of the guide, until indeed he was afraid that longer delay would expose him to the arrest which he had so much desired to avoid, and then telling Leonard that he would hasten forward to the outskirts of the town, where he would await the guide. Leonard Hust promised to bring him directly, and thus they parted, the younger brother hastening toward the jungle at the environs of Sierra Leone, at length reached the designated spot, where he quietly awaited the arrival of his guide. It was quite dark before the expected individual came, but at length he did arrive, and thrusting a note into the hands of the impatient refugee, waited for orders. Charles opened the paper and read in a rough schoolboy hand that he, Leonard Hust, had intended to come see him off, but that he could not, and that the bearer was a faithful guide, somewhat eccentric, but reliable. Charles Bramble looked carefully for a few moments at the companion of his long and dangerous journey. He saw before him the person of a negro, slender, agile, rather below the usual height, and clothed after the style of the settlers in pants and jacket, but with a red handkerchief bound upon the head. In a coarse leathern belt the negro wore a shirt, double-edged knife, and a pistol, while in his hand he held a short, sharp spear, 
which served for staff and weapon both, and was designed more particularly for defense against the wild animals that infested the jungle in all directions. The guide was painted in the face after fantastic style often adopted by the shore tribes in Africa, in alternate lines of red and yellow and white, so as to give a most strange and inhuman expression to the countenance. But Charles Bramble was familiar with these tricks of the race, and saluting the guide kindly told him his plans, and asked if he could guide him on his route. Being assured in the affirmative, he felt satisfied, and the two, by the light of the moon, which was now creeping up in the heavens, commenced their journey, intending, after passing a few leagues, to make up their camp, light their fires to keep off the wild animals, and sleep. The resting place was at last found, and after the usual arrangements had been completed, and a circle of fire built around them, the two lay down to sleep. Fatigue soon closed the eyes of our young adventurer, and he slept soundly, how long he knew not. But after a while he was awakened by the breathing of some decayed branches near him, and partially opened his eyes, half asleep, half conscious, when to his utter amazement he beheld, or fancied he beheld, a dozen pairs of glistening eyes peering at him from out of the jungle. He did not stir, but feigning to be still asleep, he cautiously watched to see what all this meant. They surely did not belong to wild animals, those eyes. He partially turned, without moving his body, to ascertain if the guide was still with him, but found that he was gone. There was treachery somewhere. There was danger about him. This he seemed to feel instinctively. But still feigning asleep, he almost held his breath to listen. He soon learned, by his sense of clearing, that there was some half-dozen or more of the negroes near to him, and that he was subject of their conversation. He could even detect his guide's voice among the rest, though the conversation was carried on scarcely above a whisper. He had on a previous voyage taken much pains to familiarize himself with the language spoken by the shore tribes in the south, and now he had little difficulty in understanding a considerable portion of the remarks which were making by the gang who were secreted in the jungle so near to where he was lying while he was pretending sleep. He soon learned that his guide was followed by half a dozen or more of negroes who had lately visited Sierra Leone on some business of their own, and who, in common with the guide, belonged to a fierce and warlike tribe whose chief village was but a few leagues from Don Leonardo's factory. At first it was difficult to make out the actual purport of their scheme, although Charles Bramble could guess what he did not hear and was satisfied that the cannibals intended to lead him, apparently in good faith, to the neighborhood of their village, where he was to be seized, sacrificed to some deity of those poor ignorant creatures' manufacture, and afterwards be eaten in council with great ceremony. All this he could distinctly make out, and certainly it was anything but agreeable to him. But Charles Bramble knew the race he had to deal with. He fully understood the fact that, one after white man with his wits about him was equal to cope with a dozen of them at any time, and he felt prepared. He gathered at once that it was their intention to guide him safely until near their own village, where they would seize upon him and from that moment make him a prisoner. Meanwhile, none but his guide was to be seen by the traveller, so it was agreed and he was to receive care and kind attention until the time appointed. Knowing all this, of course he was prepared for it, and now saw for the present, and a few coming days, he need have no alarm. And beyond that he must trust to his ready wit, personal prowess, and indomitable courage, which was natural to him. It may seem strange, but reasoning thus, he soon fell to sleep again in good earnest. The next morning he met his guide with frankness, and the best of feeling seemed to prevail day after day, until suddenly one evening before night had fairly set in, and the day before he had anticipated any such attempt, the negro suddenly fell upon him, and pinned his arms, and otherwise disabled him, so that he was completely at their mercy. Already they had arrived at the environs of their village, 
and into it they bore him in great triumph. Council was at once held, and it was resolved that on the morrow the prisoner should be sacrificed, and cooked, and eaten. This was anything but agreeable to our adventurer, but he did not despair. Thrusting his hand into his pack, he discovered an almanac that he had brought with him from Cuba. Turning over the hieroglyphics in singular figurines, to the wonder and amusement of the negroes, he saw that on the morrow an eclipse of the sun would take place, and he immediately resolved to turn that fact to good account. He summoned the chief of the tribe and told him, to no small amazement, in his own tongue, that to-morrow the great spirit that ruled the sun would put a veil over it in displeasure at the detention of the white child by them, but that as soon as they should loose his feet and arms and set him free, the veil would be removed. Amazed at such an assertion, the chief consulted among his brethren, and it was agreed that if the white man's story proved true, that he should be released. At the hour appointed on the following day, the negroes were surprised and terrified to see the gradual and almost total eclipse of the sun, and attributed it to the great spirit's displeasure because of their detention of the white prisoner, as he had foretold. They hastened to loose his arms and to set him on his way rejoicing. They even bore him on their shoulders for leagues in a sort of triumphal march, and did not permit him to walk until they had brought him safely and deposited him with his arms and pack before the doors of Don Leonardo. End of chapter 16seventeen of the sea witch this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by elliot miller the sea witch by matcher and murray Ballou. chapter seventeen the poison bar of course don leonardo was amazed to see his friend deeming him by this time either in an English prison or dead. He learned with amazement that part that Maud had performed, for Charles Bramble was forced to reveal to the father, who was eager to inquire after his daughter. Though Charles felt not the least compunctions of conscience as to the matter, yet he now fully realized the cause of all her enmity, though of this he said not a word to her father. Don Leonardo cheerfully joined this newcomer in completing his business arrangements, and Charles Bramble found himself the rightful owner of some eight thousand dollars in gold, the product of the goods which he had landed as his private venture, and he also took good care to forward true bills of credit to his owners in Cuba, for the specie which had been sent out to him to purchase slaves. These business re arrangements consummated, he now began to think seriously of once more revisiting the scenes of his childhood, Bramble Park. He doubted not that Helen and her mother would arrive at their own early home, which adjoined that of Bramble Park, and which, by the way, had been leased during their settlement in India, as early as he could himself procure conveyance which would enable him to reach the spot. With this idea he eagerly scanned the horizon daily, hoping for the arrival of some craft, even a slaver that might bear him away, either towards America or Europe, so that he might get into the course of travel. One morning, when he had as usual gone up to the lookout and scanned the sea-view far and near, he at last came down to the breakfast-room with his face quite speaking with inward satisfaction. He had seen a sail, evidently a large merchantman and begged Don Leonardo to go up and see if together they could not make the stranger out more fully. Charles himself thought that she was a heavy and evidently steering for the small bay on which the factory stood. But their curiosity was soon to be satisfied, for spar after spar gradually became more and more clearly defined, until at last the deck itself could be seen, and St. George's Cross observed flying saucily in the breeze. The ship was a British sloop of war, and so it proved. In an hour more Captain Robert Bramble came on shore, accompanied by Helen and her mother, with Maud Leonardo. As it afterwards appeared, Maud desired to be brought back to her father, and the English ship was but performing its appointed duty in cruising on the coast. 
while Helen, knowing that Charles had come hither, persuaded her mother that it was best to sail with Captain Bramble, rather than stop in Sierra Leone, among utter strangers. For on shipboard they were under his care, and besides, as she admitted to her mother, she had good reason for supposing that Captain Will Ratlin, for thus the mother knew him still, was at Bay Salo, as Don Leonardo's factory was called on the coast. Thus it was that they were once more on this spot. The brothers met before the collected members of the returning party and those on the shore, and regarded each other with a stern glance. It was the only token of recognition which passed between them. But Charles hastened to Helen's side, and pressing her hand tenderly, looked the words that he could not speak before others. Mrs. Huntington seemed overjoyed, too, at joining one whom she felt was a true friend to herself and daughter, and unhesitatingly evinced this feeling, while Maud and Captain Robert Bramble walked by themselves filled with bitter thoughts. Robert had at once presumed as to whither his brother had escaped, well knowing that he must here have left unsettled business accounts of great value and importance. He therefore was prepared for this meeting which took place as we have seen. The quadroon saw Helen and Charles thus together. She saw the delight that this meeting caused to both. She was witness to the elegant language of the eyes that beamed into each other, and then she hastened from the spot, crazed with bitterness of feeling, and fall of direful purpose. Had she been observed at that moment, it would have been seen that there was danger in her. To her father's kind salute she turned a deaf ear, and hastened into the dwelling with headlong speed. Charles and Helen had much to say to each other. Now that he had told his love, now that the dark veil had been removed from the past that had obscured his origin, he felt confidence, and spoke with manly cheer and a light heart. The most indifferent observer would have noticed this, and it waits not without its effects upon Helen, who looked brighter and happier than ever before, and the two succeeded at once in infusing a degree of cheerfulness all around them, reflected by Helen's mother and even Don Leonardo, with his heavy eyebrows and shaggy beard. Captain Robert Bramble and Maud alone seemed unhappy, and they were moody indeed. It was towards the twilight hour on the very day of the arrival, which we have referred to, that Charles and Helen arm in arm started away from the house to the adjacent jungle, which, where it was a pleasant trysting place, with a seat prepared for resort from the house. Breathing into each other's ears the glad and trusting accents of true love, they sauntered slowly hither and sat down there, Helen upon the rude but comfortable seat, and Charles at her feet upon the ground. About them grew the rank, luxuriant foliage of Africa, fragrant flowers bloomed within reach of their hands, and luscious fruit greeted the eye whichever direction it sought. The soft air of the after part of the day was laden with sweetness and they seemed to gather fresh incentive for tenderness and love in the particular surroundings of the spot. "'So you have broken off all connection with this business, and have settled your accounts with Don Leonardo, have you not?' asked Helen, of him at her feet. "'Yes, dearest. All has been done, and I shall have no more to do with the trade of this unhospitable coast, you may be assured.' My only hope and desire is once more to see you and your mother safe in England, where I can make you by sacred ties of my own. Helen looked the tender response that beat in her heart, but which her lips refused to pronounce. She was very, very happy, and they talked over olden times, childish recollections, and the memories of their early home. While Charles and Helen were thus engaged, Two other individuals closely connected with the plot of our story were not idle. Captain Robert Bramble was now satisfied that without physical force he could not intervene between his rival brother and Helen Huntington. He would gladly have done this, but policy prevented, for he saw that in doing so he would but gratify his revenge without approaching a single step nearer the consummation of his wishes. It was nearly the appointed date for the sailing of his ship from the station for England and he had made up his mind to return at once to Sierra Leone and prepare to sail homeward. 
He had already taken leave of Mrs. Huntington, and was seeking her daughter to say farewell. The wind was fair, he would sail within the hour, and on inquiring for Helen he was told by some one that she had been seen a few moments before walking towards the jungle. The informant did not say, in the company of whom she so evidently loved, and Robert Bramble hastened forward in hopes that he might meet her there, alone. Perhaps even one more pressed that oft-rejected suit. He even thought as he went what he would say to her, and wondered how she would receive him. It was difficult to say what it was in his bosom which caused him so tenaciously to pursue this vain desire. His was not the heart to die for love. It amounted almost to an obstinacy. He was self-willed, and was accustomed to have his own way in all things. Here he had been thwarted from the very outset. Maud Leonardo, since her arrival home, was scarcely herself. She avoided all intercourse, spoke to no one, and locked herself in her chamber. But now she started front, intent on some purpose, as was evident from the direct and prompt step she pursued. Yes, from her window she had seen Charles and Helen wander leisurely and affectionately towards the jungle. And to the same point she now directed her steps, though by a circuitous path. She muttered to herself as she went, and walked with unwanted speed, as though she feared to lose one moment of time. At this quick pace she was soon hidden in the pass of the thick undergrowth and forest land. "'Hark! What sound is that?' said Helen, suddenly turning and peering into the thick foliage which surrounded the spot. "'I hear nothing,' replied Charles Bramble. "'It was some bird, perhaps, among these branches. But why do you look so pale, Helen?' "'It is so terrible. I thought the sound was like that of one of those terrible serpents that frequent these parts, the anaconda, creeping towards us.' "'Nay, dearest, it was but your imagination. These reptiles avoid the near approach to human habitations. I would not likely to be here. There, there it is again, she said convulsively, drawing closely to his side, while both looked towards the spot from whence at that moment a sound proceeded. In a moment more there broke forth from the clustering vines and trees the figure of a man with a drawn sword, who hastened with lowered brow towards them. It was Robert Bramble and sensed beyond endurance at this sight which met his vision through the vista of the foliage on approaching the spot. He paused for but one single moment. Then, yielding to the power of his almost ungovernable temper, he drew his sword and rushed forward, determined to sacrifice his brother's life. Helen, seeing plainly and instantly the state of affairs, threw herself with a scream of terror before Charles to protect him. Unarmed as he was, from the keen weapon that gleamed in his brother's hand. But strange are the ways of providence, and past finding out. At that instant he staggered, reeled forward, and placing one hand to his forehead, fell nearly at their feet. Amazed at this, Charles and Helen both hastened to his side. But he was speechless, and ere he could be removed from the position in which he fell, life was wholly extinct. What was it that had so strangely, so suddenly sacrificed him in the midst of his fell intent? Hark! Charles starts as a shrill, low whizzing sound was heard close to his ear. The mystery is explained. A poisoned barb had killed his brother, entering the eye and piercing the brain, while this second one that had just whistled past his ear had been intended for him. He turned hastily to the direction from which the missile had come and there stood a rather staggered Maud Leonardo. He hastened now to her side as she gradually half knelt, half fell to the ground. Her eyes rolled madly in their pockets. Her hands grasped vainly at the air, and she muttered incoherently. "'Maud, Maud, what have you done?' asked Charles, leaning over her. "'The bomb was poisoned. It was meant for you,' she half shrieked. "'I'm dying, dying unrevenged, all oh, this scorching burning pain. "'What ails you, Maud? What can we do for you?' asked Charles kindly. "'I am poisoned,' groaned the quadroon, holding up her lacerated hand, which she had carelessly wounded with one of the barbs intended to have killed him. 
The barb she had wounded and killed Robert with was blown through a long hollow reed, a weapon much used in Africa, and the barb had been dipped in poison so subtle, rapid, and sure in its effect that the wound the girl had received accidentally in her hand was fast proving fatal to her. In Robert Bramble's case it had reached a vital part at once, and had almost instantly fatal in its effect. But Maud was dying. "'Poor, poor girl! What shall we say to your father?' asked Charles, for he knew full well the fatal poisons in which the negroes dipped their tiny barbs, and he realized that the quadroon, who was a victim to her own scheme of destruction, could not live but a few moments. She seemed too far gone to speak now, and turned and writhed in an agony of pain upon the ground, while Helen strove to raise her head and to comfort her. The poison seemed to act upon her by spasms, and she would have a moment now and then when she was comparatively at ease. The lowering darkness of her face was gone now. A serenity seemed to be gathering there, and leaning forward between the paroxysms, she held forth a hand which was not wounded towards Charles Bramble, who stood tenderly over her and said in a low, gentle voice, "'Forgive me. Will you, will you not forgive me?' "'With all my heart, poor girl, I do sincerely forgive you,' said Charles earnestly. All was not black in that human heart. The half-effaced image of its maker was there still, and Maud looked tenderly and penitently upon Helen and Charles. The former knelt by her side, and drawing the poor girl's hands together across her breast as she lay upon the ground, lifted her own hands heavenward moving her lips in prayer as she bent over the sufferer. What little Maud knew of religious instruction had been taught her in the form of the Episcopal Church, and now she listened to the formal prayer from the litany appropriate to her situation. A sweet smile gathered over her face as Helen proceeded, and prayed for forgiveness for all sins committed, and as she paused at the close three voices repeated the word Amen. Charles and Helen rose to their feet, but the spirit of the quadroon had fled. End of chapter 17THE SEA WITCH by Matcher and Murray Ballou CHAPTER Eighteen, THE DENOUEMENT The events of the past few weeks seemed to Charles Bramble more like dream than reality. He could hardly compose his mind sufficiently to realize the serious bearings of his present situation. Of course, it was now useless longer to disguise his relationship to Robert, who had lost his life by means of the poisoned barb which Maud had intended for his brother. Charles took possession of his body, and informed all those necessary duties that his own feelings suggested, and form required. The second officer of the ship assumed the command vacated by Captain Robert's death, and as the time had now arrived for the return of the vessel to England, he sailed at once for Liverpool. Though Charles was loath to be separated from Helen, yet he urged upon herself and mother to join the English man of war in which they could secure the most comfortable and safest passage to Liverpool, while for himself there was still left business matters which it was imperative for him to consummate before he left the region where he was. It was at last decided that the mother and daughter should improve this mode of conveyance home, and Helen reluctantly bade him so that she tenderly loved a tearful farewell, and in secret they pledged to each other their hearts for life. Charles Bramble watched the receding ship which contained her so dear to him, until it was a mere speck upon the waters, and then felt that it was possibly the last token he might ever see of her. The path before him was not one strewn with roses. He had serious dangers to encounter, a long voyage to make, and an unhealthy climate to endure. For he must cross the ocean, he found, in order to settle honorably with those men who had placed such unlimited faith in his integrity but he had no ship or craft of any sort at his command, and must wait for opportunity to reach the West Indies, doubtless on board some vessel in the trade which he had just abandoned. 
Don Leonardo seemed to little heed the death of his daughter. In fact, he did not trouble himself to inquire into its particulars, further than to understand the immediate cause. He was a sensual and intemperate man, half of whose life passed under the effects of unnatural stimulus, and provided his appetite was not interfered with, cared little what befell others. Since the English man-of-war had sailed, his barracoons began to fill once more with negroes from the interior and he was now prepared to ship a cargo by the first adventurer's vessel which should arrive. The funds which Charles Bramble had brought out from Cuba to Africa were co-signed to Don Leonardo, and he of course would do with the money as he pleased. He therefore proposed to charter the first vessel that came, a ship, a cargo the same as he would have done in the Sea Witch. It was not long before one of those flat, low, dark clipper schooners hove in sight and ran into the bay. She was small, sat deep in the water, was scarcely three hundred tons burthen, but managed to stow three hundred and forty negroes with ease, and would have taken more had not intelligence from the lookouts been brought in, that a square rig was coming down the coast. Charles Bramble hesitated whether he should embark in this craft. It was consigned to his former owners, the very men he wished to meet. He might have to wait for months in order to obtain another chance. It was hardly a matter of choice with him, but became one of necessity, and he embarked accordingly. Charles Bramble was no sooner fairly at sea than he was filled with amazement at the condition of matters on board the slaver. Himself accustomed to enforce the most rigid discipline, he saw a perfect bedlam a crew of some thirty people, composed of the vilest of the vile, who must have been shipped only with an eye to numbers, and no regard for character or stability. Added to this, the captain, though a man of some experience as a seaman, had no control of the crew, and was quite at a loss how to manage them. Twice was Charles Bramble obligated to interfere between the crew and the captain before they were three days at sea and by his stern, calm will, he succeeded in preventing open mutiny by the crew. The fact was, the most desperate part of the foremost hands knew very well that the money sent out to purchase slaves was still on board in good golden doubloons, and they were secretly scheming to take the schooner, kill the officers, and appropriate the gold. Charles Bramble was accustomed to deal with such spirits, he was well armed at all hours, and prepared for the very trouble which was to come. Inasmuch he had anticipated it. There were two mates and the captain beside himself, who might be relied upon to stand by the vessel and the owner's rights, but they had fearful odds against them. There was also a lad who had gone out in the Sea Witch as a cabin boy, whom Charles Bramble was now bringing back with him to his family in Cuba the boy having escaped the massacre which occurred when the sea witch was burned, and who had been living at Leonardo's factory. On him also he felt he could rely. The boy soon discovered that mutiny was hatching, and told the captain secretly that it would occur at the moment land was announced from the masthead on making the islands of the West Indies. This was all the information necessary for Charles Bramble to whom the captain of the schooner gave up all control, to prepare for the emergency. He completely armed the four parties on whom he could rely, and bade them to wait for orders from him. But when he gave those orders to act instantly and without pausing for further consideration, the crew were somewhat puzzled to see their chief officer give up even the sailing of the vessel to him who had come on board as a passenger, but they could not also perceive that he who acted as the captain now was a very different man to deal with, and one who knew his business. They saw that the schooner was made to sail better than ever before, that the crew were kept in their places and busy, an important thing at sea, and though they were still resolved to make the attempt, they did not like the appearance of matters. Scarcely had the lookout, after a short passage, descried the first land, and hailed the deck with, Land ho! when a change was instantly observed among the crew. Captain Bramble, however, was on the watch, and so were his backers, and seeing this, he instantly called one of the ringleaders aft, and bade him sternly to lay his hand to a rope and pull it taut. The man instinctively obeyed at first, 
subdued by the calm, stern front of the man who addressed him. But in a moment he ceased and turned toward the officer flatly declining duty, at the same time beckoning the hands forward to come to the quarter-deck. Captain Bramble paused one second of time and repeated his order. It was not obeyed, and in the next instant the man lay a corpse with a bullet through his brains at the feet of the officer. This prompt punishment for a moment checked the action of the rest, but it was only a moment when they moved aft in a body. "'Hold where you are!' shouted the young but determined commander. "'The man who advances another step dies!' All paused, save two of the most daring of the rascals who continued to press on. Captain Ratlin now bade the mates to shoot the first man who came aft unbidden while he marched a few paces forward, and once more bid them stand. They heeded him not, and the foremost one fell with a bullet through his heart. Captain Ratlin instantly drew a fresh weapon from his bosom and presented it at the other foremost man. "'Fall back! Fall back, you imps of darkness! Fall back, I say, or you die!' The crew had not counted on this summary treatment. They were beaten and mastered. The culprit addressed sneaked back among the crew, trembling with fear. Captain Ratlin returned to the quarter-deck, received fresh arms from one of the mates, and then calmly began to issue orders for the sailing of the vessel, as though nothing had occurred to interfere with the business routine of the day. Those orders were promptly obeyed. The master spirit there had asserted its control, and established it, too. And a more orderly crew never moored a slave-ship on the south side of Cuba than were soon busily engaged in that duty after the set of sun on the day when this bold attempt at mutiny had occurred. This little affair, which had come very near to costing Charles Bramble his life, was in one sense a fortunate one, since it put him on the best of terms with the owners, who had entrusted him with the sea witch, and who now pressed a gratuity of two thousand dollars upon him for his part in the present voyage, and forwarded him safely without expense on his return voyage to England. This additional amount of funds he, to his already handsome sum of personal property gave him ten, some ten thousand dollars of ready money, which he took with him to his homestead at Bramble Park. The money enabled him not only to clear the estate of all encumbrances, but also to make his mother, now aged and bedridden, comfortable. But he was soon married, and with Helen Huntington, whose estates joined those of Bramble Park, he obtained a large fortune. But best of all, he took to his arms a sweet, intelligent, and loving wife. She with whom he had played in childhood amid these very scenes, and she whom he had rescued upon the waters of the ocean. She who had loved and reformed him. End of chapter 18 The Sea Witch by Maturin Murray Ballou Recording by Elliot Miller, Oswego, Illinois, March 2009